Good evening, everyone. Your Excellency, Honorable Minister, Your Worship, Mayor Robertson, and my friends and so many colleagues and, uh, and newcomers, I think, to the Centre for Dialogue. My name is Shauna Sylvester and I am the director of the SFU Centre for Dialogue. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this beautiful space. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil And I think we're all here because there is something major coming up in December. As we know, Paris is going to be the center of one of the most important meetings of our time and of our decade, and that's the meeting of the parties, COP21. And tonight we're going to have a chance to hear how we prepare for that meeting from a local perspective, from a provincial perspective, from a national and international perspective. And as I look around the room, there is deep expertise here. And I'm excited to see within all corners, well, within this circle, that there are a number of you that bring expertise to this issue. I want to thank each of you tonight for taking time out of your busy schedule. You could be anywhere, but you're taking the time and making the commitment to be here tonight, and I want to acknowledge that. One of the goals of the SFU Center for Dialogue is to convene nonpartisan and constructive discussions around important issues, and I can't think of a more important issue of our time than addressing climate change. Now, like any dialogue we host here at SFU, we anticipate that the evening will be lively and engaging. And I hope you will take full advantage of the expertise here on our panel and within this room and really engage in the dialogue and the learning. And I want to encourage you also to share your learnings with others, to amplify beyond this room, to use the Twitter feeds, uh, to use your social media to extend our reach. Now, I'm looking forward to being a full participant tonight, so I want to uh, hand over this evening to the competent hands of our moderator, Michael Small. Now, I've known Michael for many years. He is a new fellow at the Center for Dialogue and the new executive director of Carbon Talks and Renewable Cities. Before joining SFU, Michael served as the High Commissioner for Canada to Australia. He joined the Canadian Foreign Service in 1981, and he has had postings in Malaysia, Brazil, Costa Rica, and Mexico. He also served as our ambassador to Cuba. While at headquarters in Ottawa at the Department of Foreign Affairs, Michael served as the coordinator, and this is where I met him, to the Canadian delegation to the Rio Summit. He was the director of our Peace Building and Human Security Division. Many of you who knew Lloyd Axworthy's work will know that that was led by Michael Small. He was the Director General for Human, human Security and Human Rights, and in 20, 2006 he was appointed Assistant Deputy Minister Global Issues and served as our Commonwealth Senior and Canada Forest Minister Sue Sherpa for the 2007 and 2008 G7 summits. He's also served as our Assistant Deputy Minister of Human Resources and a member of the Executive Council for Foreign Affairs. Michael, it is an honour to have you take us forward as a moderator of this session. Thank you very much, Sean, and thank, welcome to everyone. Um, I'm a little embarrassed by the, that very uh, elaborate introduction of me because I told our eminent speakers that I would be very brief in introducing them. So and, and I think you've all come to hear the speakers and the subject at hand is, uh, speaks for itself and, and I'll let them address the topic in just a minute. So my role is to moderate and let me just explain a few things about how we're going to proceed. So first of all, uh, these events don't happen. By accident, they take planning. Uh, this event has been a, a terrific collaboration between the Center of Dialogue, Carbon Talks, the program that I have the great pleasure of leading at the moment, and the Consulate General of France here uh, in Vancouver, and of course the Embassy of France. So we're really uh, delighted to be able to do that together. We have other important partners, and they're listed there. Locals are there up on the screen. The North Growth Foundation, which supports constantly our work on climate change issues at the Center for Dialogue. The Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, whose executive director, Tom Pedersen, will also be our first uh, discussant when we get to that part of the program. 
And uh, again, I mentioned the French Consulate General. You should know that this event is actually part of a much larger series called FACTS, French American Climate Talks. And we're really delighted to be able to have one here in Vancouver and with such an eminent group of speakers, uh, a politically relevant group of, of speakers from different perspectives to talk about it. Um, I'm going to put in and do, take a moment of shameless self-promotion, or rather institutional promotion. You'll all have these colorful little cards. Uh, this uh, is to in, <coughs> advertise an event coming up in two months' time, which the Center for Dialogue is hosting an international conference uh, on the issue of, of renewable cities, which is a theme that's just getting a lot of attention and is directly relevant to what we'll be talking about today, um, about how cities, uh, cities like Vancouver and others, can exercise leadership in the challenge of particularly to making much greater use of renewable energy. And the really on, only important words on this piece of paper are uh, register now and the dates May 13th to 15th. So I sincerely hope that it'll be of interest to some in the room and you'll know others who would enjoy participating in that event. Uh, let me just then proceed to explain how we'll unfold. We'll ask each of our speakers to uh, speak in order for 10 minutes. Uh, I'll introduce each of them just before they come up to speak and they'll be intervening in, in the order in which they're seated on the panel. Uh, Tom Pedersen will then be our first discussant. We'll give the speakers five minutes after that to uh, offer some comments or questions back and forth to each other because really we want to emphasize dialogue and this room is terrific for that purpose. And then we'll have 40 minutes for questions and comments from the room. As always in any event, comments are welcome, but they should be brief, at least as brief as questions. If they're not brief, I'll exercise my moderator authority to intervene and move the conversation along. But by all means, uh, do uh, contribute to help generating a discussion among participants in the room and of course with our distinguished speakers. As Shauna has already said, uh, we encourage you to tweet. The hashtag is there, COP21, or, and also to send questions. Uh, and we'll be taking questions as well. Uh, at Carbon Talks. Uh, this is being live webcast, and I know there are people that are watching this event uh, from other locations in Canada, maybe beyond. So uh, we really do want to make this as inclusive as we can. Our intention is to end sharp at 6.30. So we have a good chunk of time, and with that, no further ado uh, or complications, I'd like to uh, proceed to invite the Ambassador of France um, to come to the podium, Ambassador Nicolas Chapuis. Uh, arrived very recently in Canada in early February to take up the role as, as uh, France's ambassador to Canada. He served, uh, had a very distinguished career in the French foreign ministry, serving earlier on as France's ambassador to Mongolia, serving in China. He's also an expert on digital diplomacy, and I'm sure he'll want to weave those themes together in his presentation on the role that, as France sees it of the challenges before the world for the COP21 taking place in Paris. Mr. Mr. Ambassador. Merci, Michael. Bonsoir à tous. Don't worry, I'll speak in English. It is a pleasure, a real pleasure, a personal and professional pleasure, and a great honor to be alongside Minister Pollack and Mayor Robertson, who are leading a cause in British Columbia which paved the way to Paris. It is one of the greatest examples of how subnational states have devised policies for a long time. It's not begun this year. It had begun a long time before. That brings you here in this conference room. The level of interest of British Columbians, of Canadians, to the effort that will bring results, we hope, in Paris is very encouraging for the French ambassador. So I will speak briefly, less than 10 minutes, this evening on behalf of the French government, of course, but also on behalf of the French presidency of COP21, the conference of parties to the United Nations on climate change. And some may reflect COP21, 21 meetings to do what? Where do we stand? Are we going to have an agreement? Why did Kyoto fail? What happened in Copenhagen? Well, these are the questions that were raised in Warsaw uh, 18 months ago, in uh, December 2013, when we found out that there was no candidate to host COP21. 
that nobody wanted to take up the challenge of a Copenhagen failure and try to bring up an agreement. Well, France took the risk. And now we count on your support, each one of you, each one of your friends. Please help us rally the support necessary to succeed where we have failed. And when we say we, I include, of course, France. We have failed in the past. We need to succeed this time. Why? Because we have no choice. As you know, Ban Ki-moon said, the Secretary General of the United Nations, please remember, despite the numbers of sci-fi novels or films you are watching, there's no planet B. And I said in Montreal last week, there's no Canada B. There's just a Canada A. There's no British Columbia B. There's no Vancouver B. So let's grasp in our minds that the skeptics are wrong, definitively wrong. There are still people who say that uh, climate change is a liberal invention or that uh, it is an intellectual creation. No, the science is there. And the science say terrible things if we do not act. Paris is all about action. Act for climate, to fight against climate change. Because the cost of inaction is terrible. It's economically uh, catastrophic. Where will we find the money collectively to pay for expenses uh, on floods, uh, forest fires, uh, drought, uh, snowfalls in the east, extreme cold, failure of electrical power stations, and so on. Where do we find the money? We have to invest now in order to limit the rate of temperature to two degrees Celsius. And the scientists tell us that two degrees Celsius more is already too much. But please remember that if we do not act, the, raise of temp the rise of temperatures, the road we are on today, is plus four, plus five. So that's why we need to have a high level of ambition. How do we do that? What will be different in Paris, say the skeptics? What has changed in the international community to ensure that Paris will be a success? The answer is simple. You have changed. You know, each one of you, that governments have to act. And what are governments today, if not the reflection of the citizens? So if each citizen of the globe say, we want action, then the negotiating teams in Paris will draw that agreement, however difficult it is. There is a principle that did not operate well in Copenhagen six years ago that will be efficient in Paris. This principle is common responsibility, all human race has a common responsibility on climate change, but with different, differentiated solutions. Because it is logical and fair to say that developing countries should not bear the economic weight of the developed countries' pollution. Especially when in a global world, our companies, French companies, Canadian companies, American companies, Russian companies have all flocked to China to make China the biggest polluter. But whose responsibility is it if not of world companies? Of course, China has its part, but we have our part. It is a global world. Climate has no borders. So common responsibility, 
differentiated solutions mean that the North, the developed countries, including Canada, will have to finance adaptation of the South to uh, the climate change and to find carbon neutral uh, solutions. In Paris, we will hope to have that agreement to bring about a fund of 100 billion US dollars a year beginning in 2020. This fund, which will be public and private, will finance the adaptation of developing countries in order to adapt to the new solutions. But what are the new solutions? Then Paris again, and that will be a big change compared to the 20 conferences that were held before, will have a window of these solutions, what we call the village of alternatives. 20,000 people, we expect, will come to Paris to present their solutions, NGOs, cities, provincial governments, civilian actors of change, militants of the environment, everybody is welcome in Paris next December to show their solutions and to share them with the world. So, do you see the equation? A target, 2%, 2 degrees Celsius. The, bur the, the means, the finances, $100 billion a year. But it's less costly than to pay for the catastrophic failures that we might risk. The technological solutions, all this under a legally binding agreement an agreement which will bind 196 parties of the United Nations. Yes, we have a dream. Yes, Canada shares it because you are part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Mary Pollack, British Columbia's Minister of Environment. Um, Minister Pollock was first elected in 2005 and has represented her constituents uh, in Langley. Uh, since then, in the BC Legislature, she was appointed Minister of Environment in June of 2013 after successful re-election. Uh, she has been to involved in the climate files. Uh, she was telling me just before this began that she was present at the last COP in Lima and is looking forward to going to Paris. And I'm sure she'll be pleased to give you a lot more of an outline of a BC perspective on the issues before us. Minister? Thank you, Michael. And I'm going to apologize ahead of time. You may find me coughing during part of the speech. I'm, uh, I'm incubating some kind of cold, so I won't, I won't shake a lot of your hands either. I want to, first of all, of course, acknowledge the traditional territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the tsleil And uh, I certainly want to thank the Consulate General of France in Vancouver, the Pacific Institute of Climate, for Climate Solutions, uh, and of course, uh, Simon Fraser University's Carbon Talks for hosting us all here today. Uh, Your Excellency, I also want to thank you for uh, making Vancouver one of your uh, first visits outside of Ottawa since you've been uh, the ambassador from France. We certainly are glad to welcome you here and glad we could uh, provide some sunny weather for you as well. Uh, when I attended Lima COP20 Climate Talks in December, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Anne-Marie Decourt, and uh, we had a fantastic conversation about the role that national governments together with subnationals can play as we try to reach these solutions when we attend in Paris at COP21. We talked about Paris's role during the upcoming COP21 Climate Talks and how Vancouver represented here by His Worship, Mayor Robertson, is a leading international city with regards to climate action. 
I've had a chance to speak with very many people internationally, and I very much enjoyed hearing uh, what you had to say today, Your Excellency. You are absolutely inspiring, uh, and I'm, I'm sure uh, the rest will acknowledge it's a tough act for me to follow, but I'm going to do my best. Um, when we say that climate change is a global issue, I think very often when we're talking to members of the public, that instantly makes it feel to them as though it's too big for them to have any kind of an impact. We have to acknowledge, it's important for us to point out, that we all contribute to climate change. And that means we are all going to be affected by its impacts if the action we take isn't aggressive enough. British Columbia has been a climate leader with our revenue neutral carbon tax, one of the first and one of the most comprehensive prices on carbon in North America. And we have a suite of leading policies that are supported by that price. BC has been cited by the World Bank, as well as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, as a model of smart climate policy. But on a global scale, we're still a relatively small emitter. And that's why BC and other subnational governments at the provincial or state, regional, and municipal levels can work together to help coordinate broader international efforts to adopt practices that protect our environment. These efforts are more important than ever this year as national governments come together in December to finalize that new global climate agreement at COP21 in Paris, one that we hope will be the beginning of a new story to tell on climate. An important principle of British Columbia's approach to climate action is that collaboration. British Columbia collaborates with other Canadian provinces and, of course, our federal government. Our success on climate is Canada's success globally, and it's also our role as provinces to take the actions that will help Canada meet its 2020 commitments and the new post-2020 commitments that will be made this year in Paris. Canada's federal government has begun now to process uh, the process to find out how our provincial actions can feed into the national commitment. It's the mandate of the federal government to set and to keep its global commitments, and it's the role of the provinces to take actions that are right for them to grow their economies and at the same time protect the environment. Provinces have taken different pathways to combat climate change. There's a cap and trade system in Quebec, a levy on major emitters in Alberta, and a revenue neutral carbon tax in British Columbia. We know Ontario will soon follow and announce its own price on carbon in the spring. In April, Canada's premiers will be meeting in Quebec to discuss climate change and the significant economic opportunities that can be realized by taking action. Our province also works closely with local governments and municipalities, as many of the decisions that result in the biggest greenhouse gas emissions reductions come from the leadership of our cities and communities. In British Columbia, local governments have influence over about 40% of all of our GHG emissions. Our Climate Action Charter, the highly regarded agreement between the province and local government signatories, helps drive climate action at the community level. The Charter commits these local governments to take actions and develop strategies to accomplish a number of significant goals, to achieve carbon neutrality in their corporate operations, to measure and report on community GHG emissions, to create complete and to create complete, compact, and energy efficient communities. And although the Charter is a voluntary agreement between the province and local governments, all but eight of 190 local governments in British Columbia have signed it and are acting on it. Of course, we also collaborate across international borders. British Columbia has worked with a number of international organizations for the past eight years to support global action on climate change. This past December at COP20 in Lima, British Columbia signed an international agreement that demonstrates the value of global climate action on a subnational level. The Compact of States and Regions commits subnational governments to provide GHG inventory data and progress toward GHG reduction commitments annually on a shared public platform. What's significant about the Compact is the recognition of the important leadership role that subnational governments play in moving the dial on climate action globally. Excuse me. 
<clears throat> the other signatories included Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba, Basque Country, Catalonia, KwaZulu-Natal, Lombardy, North Rhine-Westphalia, Rhône-Alps, Scotland, Tasmania, and Wales. British Columbia has also partnered in the World Bank's new Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. The coalition brings together leaders from government, business, and civil society to share their experiences working with carbon pricing and will expand the evidence for developing effective carbon pricing systems and policies. <coughs> As one of the first jurisdictions to bring in a strong and comprehensive revenue neutral carbon tax, BC can provide the proof for other jurisdictions that it is possible to introduce a carbon price, encourage investment in cleaner technologies, <coughs> I may make my speech even shorter, <coughs> while at the same time growing the economy and reducing emissions. The short message being, that British Columbia's experience has been uh, <coughs> maybe that did it. <clears throat> GDP up, emissions down, and still able to win an election. I'm not crying, honestly, it's the cough. <laughs> <coughs> and still being able to reach electoral success. Um, it's very easy. Okay, excuse me. keep talking, I'm going to keep coughing. So I will end on this, because I know we'll have time for more discussion. The easiest thing in the world is just to stop doing anything. Stop developing, stop producing jobs, stop growing your economy. That's the easiest way to stop climate change. It's also totally impractical. The biggest challenge facing us is how we work together to ensure that not only in, developing, in developed nations, but in developing nations, we're finding those solutions to allow economies to grow while at the same time addressing the critical issue of climate change. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Minister, and thank you to the kind person who just brought her a second glass of water. Uh, it's now my great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, His Worship, uh, Gregor Robertson, uh, Mayor of Vancouver, who I'm certain needs no introduction uh, to this audience, simply to say that uh, he was first elected mayor in November 2008, re-elected for his third term uh, last year, and has been responsible for implementing Vancouver's Greenest City Action Plan, and I'm sure he'll be delighted to give you a lot more details on that as it applies to the issues we're discussing tonight. Hey, Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's great to see the, a full house, and uh, I'll, I'll echo our, our thanks to our local First Nations, Coast Salish First Nations, and uh, to our hosts here, SFU, the Ambassador, Minister, thank you for joining us, and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Small here. We, um, we are lucky to be gathered and to be talking about the most important topic of our time. Even more important that we walk out of here committed to taking more action and making sure that the days and nights between now and Paris are full of progress and commitments to taking action around the world. We uh, as a city are, are a lucky city. We have uh, have had a legacy of, uh, of important actions that have really made us, well, the greenest city in North America. I think safe to say we're in the top 10 globally. And we have set a very clear goal to be the greenest city in the world by 2020. Climate is absolutely crucial to that uh, and, and reducing our impacts uh, on uh, our atmosphere and climate. But it is a, a wide array of targets. It's like a decathlon that we uh, are in with uh, competing with cities around the world to be the greenest, which has a, a very direct economic benefit and an, and an equally direct uh, benefit to quality of life, which we uh, in Vancouver hold dear and uh, I don't think there's any interest in, uh, in slacking off on our desire to have the most livable city in the world, but that means we have to up our game in terms of taking care of our environment and uh, living more sustainably in this city. So as a city, we, we have the lowest greenhouse gas emissions per capita in North America right now. We continue to chase uh, European cities who, uh, who were onto this uh, a lot earlier than certainly North American and Asian and uh, African cities. But it is a, a, 
is a global competition right now, striving to bring down uh, those emissions and to make our cities that much more livable. We, as a city, ha are meeting our Kyoto targets. At the same time, we're seeing quite dramatic population and economic growth, kind of echoing the words of uh, the minister. We've managed to buck that trend that says, uh, in order to grow an economy, you, you have to pollute more, you have to impact the environment. We're doing the opposite of that. And uh, we are projecting to continue making that progress. There's been a lot of local, local leadership. There's been generations of it here in Vancouver. And that uh, goes back to how the city was planned from the outset to be a walkable city, uh, how, how community could be created here without cars. Cars uh, were uh, imposed as the city grew. But uh, we have seen an incredible growth in uh, people choosing to take transit, to walk, to bike in this city, and uh, car use declining in our city. The number of cars coming into our downtown dropping by about 1% a year for over 20 years now. So uh, we've been able to grow without the number of cars uh, swamping us and increasing. Uh, people in this city fought a freeway being built right through the core of the city as well, uh, as an example, uh, going back some years. Uh, our provincial government took action uh, in, in the past, protecting the ALR so we'd have a more robust source of local food uh, at our at, uh, close at hand. BC Hydro and the legacy of having uh, renewable energy available, which is uh, high 90% of uh, Vancouver's electricity. Uh, we have uh, a history of investing in transit, although we're embroiled right now in a difficult referendum to approve the next, uh, the next funding tools and dollars that can be invested directly in transit so people can make a good choice and, and reduce their impact on uh, climate and the environment by making good transportation choices. So, um, but we've built a good system here, one of the best in North America, certainly, uh, and we need to continue doing that. Vote yes in the referendum. I'll shamelessly uh, come back to that a few times today. I figured that was probably a, a winner in this crowd. If it, if it wasn't, we'd be in big trouble. Uh, but we're seeing climate impacts. Certainly as a city, we, we are already facing the impacts uh, through the last couple of winters with sea level rise uh, pounding on our seawall. Uh, modest compared to the, the projected cost of $9.5 billion of sea level rise impacts on Metro Vancouver. That's the rough, uh, I think, very conservative estimate right now that we face uh, with the projected sea level rise. But we've already seen dramatic impact on uh, BC's economy with the pine beetle. Uh, we've had climate impacts already and, and those will only magnify in the years to come. So obvious, uh, obvious reasons for us to take action. Cities around the world are leading the charge and uh, we don't have a choice. We're on the front lines. We're the most uh, direct uh, order of government and uh, citizens frankly are demanding that we make changes as rapidly as we can. So we're seeing, uh, as I said before, a, a, a really uh, hopeful competition between cities to, to outdo each other in, uh, in reducing our impact on climate and environment. We, um, as a city, we upped the bar yesterday. We uh, took the next step on our uh, long-term goal to eliminate our dependence on fossil fuels. We've actually now uh, passed a commitment that we will be 100% renewable energy. That's, that's from electricity to heat and uh, cooling to transportation that we will be 100% renewable energy as a city. And we now we need to set that timeline. We need to set that a goal for ourselves, but uh, the overarching commitment that we become 100% renewable is one that we have now made as a city council. So, and I, I would love to say we're, we're first uh, in the world to do that, but there are some European cities, again, who've, uh, who've already set that as a goal, uh, being fossil fuel free in a number of northern European cities is, is already a, a legislated goal, which is great. They are, again, setting the pace, and we're all learning from each other. The good ideas are flowing between cities. We, we compete uh, you know, in, in words, but in actions, uh, we're sharing all of the best practices, all of the technology. It's a, it's a very, um, a, a very uh, optimistic approach that we're taking at, at a city level. And uh, cities are now about 70% of global uh, GHG emissions, so we have to solve this in our cities. The, the growth, the urbanization of the world is happening at a dramatic scale, and uh, the cities that will frankly double in size, between now and 2050, we will double the urban population of this planet. And if we build cities that we have today, 
that, that will be the end of us, frankly. We have to build cities that are, uh, that are dramatically more sustainable, uh, one planet footprint cities, and that means re renewing the cities that we've already built in human history, which is a large task for the next couple of decades, but it's being, um, it's being grasped by uh, leadership at the local level, and uh, I'm thankful for that. We've got a lot more work to do on that front, lots to learn from each other, but a lot of the solutions to get us there in the next couple decades are with existing technologies. It's, it's, it is not rocket science. The transportation piece is gonna be the most difficult, is the toughest to project right now in terms of going 100% renewable, but, uh, but the ability for us to do that is there and we're seeing work come out of Stanford University, we're seeing work here in Canada, a new paper that was just published that I hope someone can wave around that shows that Canada has uh, an opportunity to be 100% renewable uh, in the next couple decades. It's, a, it's an achievable goal with existing technology, with policy we know we can implement, and certainly the signs that we have on the ground here in Vancouver uh, and as a province in BC where we have a diverse economy, we have an economy uh, here in Vancouver that has more jobs in technology now, uh, over 80,000 jobs in technology, low carbon jobs uh, outnumbering the, the total number of jobs in oil and gas, forestry and mining. Uh, those jobs combined don't add up to our, our technology cluster here. So we're seeing a low carbon economy emerge here in Vancouver, which was, was a city built uh, from forestry, from mining, uh, and we're seeing a, a dramatic change here. That is uh, created the most uh, economically successful city in the country right now. We are leading the country in economic growth. And uh, I would argue that growth is as sustainable as it gets for cities uh, globally right now. And as a province, uh, the carbon tax has proven to be uh, a useful tool and, and has uh, shown some light on the hope for that to happen and carbon pricing to happen everywhere else. Uh, it's great to see now almost 70% of the world's countries making a, a commitment to uh, reducing emissions and carbon pricing is inherent in that. But we're, we're seeing the right words emerging uh, as we lead into Paris. They will have to be backed up by commitments and direct action. And we will be happy to uh, work with our federal government and provincial government to implement uh, targets. Uh, we will be pushing the pace. I, I think here in Vancouver it's safe to say, as, as will many cities around the world. We are, are part of a network uh, called C40, uh, which is actually 70 rather than 40 now. 70 of the world's biggest cities working together uh, and sharing knowledge and best practices on uh, climate and, uh, and reducing our impacts. We are also uh, now part of a, a new group that's emerging around this 100% renewable, uh, setting the long range target of, uh, of, of eliminating our dependency on fossil fuels. And that's uh, actually a group that lots more cities are, are wanting to join, which is, uh, which is good to see. I'm grateful to see the level of interest in the world's cities right now. And this isn't just northern European cities and Vancouver and maybe some west coast cities. We're talking about cities around the world, cities like from New York uh, to Sydney to Tokyo. We're seeing a great deal of interest in Chinese cities, although they grapple with much, much more daunting challenges. But uh, just sum up by saying that there is real hope in cities but it will take uh, the collective action of citizens, of, uh, of businesses, of neighborhoods, of city governments being able to take action. And, and let's hope that that uh, does bubble up and make sure that the provincial, state, federal governments take action and, and deliver uh, for the long term. We, uh, we have to see the results on the ground locally, but it will be nice to see some leadership come out of, uh, of Paris. And I'm thankful we're seeing that leadership in the, from the hosts uh, stirring it up this year. And, uh, I appreciate you being here, Mr. Ambassador, and, and everyone else look forward to a good dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, our first discussant, our... Uh, there we go. Our, to lead off the discussion, I'd like to invite Tom Peterson, who's the uh, Executive Director of the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, a uh, BC uh, government-initiated institution that plays a leading role, not only in the province, but I think it's safe to say throughout North America and internationally, on thinking exactly about these problems. And Tom will give us uh, both some perspectives on the issues as well as maybe some a thought or two that he wishes to put back to our panelists. So Tom, please. Thank you, Michael. Well, I, I, will, be, uh, I will try to be brief. There's an awful lot to talk about here, but I will try to be brief. Uh, let me begin by saluting, first of all, the Republic of France and Ambassador Chapuis for the leadership 
that France is showing internationally in not only in hosting the COP21 and stepping forward to do that, but following through on that commitment, establishing the French Canadian American talk series as one example across North America and promoting the need for action pretty much, very much internationally. It's really extraordinary what France is doing and I want to salute that leadership, it's remarkable. I also want to salute the leadership of the government of British Columbia. You know, in 2008, we passed North America's first legislated broad spectrum revenue neutral carbon tax. All of you in this room, I'm sure, are quite aware of it. That tax has delivered a remarkable level of success. Our per capita fossil fuel emissions, or consumption, I should say, in British Columbia has fallen 19% relative to the rest of Canada on a per capita basis, while at the same time our economy has grown faster than the national average. And so you might say that some claim that carbon taxes are job killers. That's not true. We've demonstrated that here, and I think the government of British Columbia deserves tremendous credit for what they've done in the past. Now, there is a challenge facing us in BC, of course, and that is the carbon tax is currently frozen. We might consider what we might do as a phase two of that carbon tax, and perhaps that's a point that we can discuss later on this evening. And I also want to salute the city of Vancouver under Mayor Robertson's leadership. It's really remarkable to have a city declare a target of 100% renewable by some time in the future. Copenhagen, I think, has said that they'll be 100% renewable by 2050. They're moving on it now. They're investing heavily on that now, and they will probably get there. We have a long way to go here, but as you said, it is an achievable target. It's something we should dedicate ourselves to. Why is all of this so important? Well, two weeks ago, the community or the, the, the island nation of Vanuatu was hit by a, a cyclone, as you all know, uh, with extraordinary wind speeds, gusting up to 300 kilometers per hour, but uh, reaching a maximum of something on the order of 270 kilometers per hour. Why did that happen this year? Well, it happened because the Coral Sea which uh, occupies the waters between New Zealand and Vanuatu, was two degrees above the long-term average sea surface temperature. And that two degree warming that we saw in that part of the ocean radiated heat into the atmosphere that strengthened that cyclone and caused the immense damage that we saw on that nation. There was a repeat of that earlier in 2011 when Cyclone Yassi or Typhoon Yassi smashed into Queensland and destroyed the agricultural production that year in Queensland, Australia, and caused immense flooding. Again, the Coral Sea was two degrees above the long-term average. These things have immense consequences. Mayor Robertson mentioned the pine bark beetle in British Columbia. You know, I just checked last week how much commercially valuable pine we've lost to the pine bark beetle. It's 730 million cubic meters of commercially valuable pine we've lost. Now, we sell a cubic meter of two by fours to China today at $148 for one cubic meter worth of two by fours. So you can do the arithmetic there in terms of the potential net loss to British Columbia over many years of harvest of 730 million lost cubic meters of pine forest. It's really an extraordinary economic hit on BC and we see that when we go into the interior where 24, million, uh, 24 sawmills have now been closed in BC's interior. So not acting on climate change has extraordinary consequences, not just socially, not just environmentally, but economically. And the neat thing, what I really like about the discussion that we've heard from our three speakers this evening is that there's a sense of optimism in all three of them. And we should have that optimism because there are things happening in the world. There's something in the air more than just carbon dioxide. There's something in the air that there's an excitement building as we move toward Paris in December. And I have to retain some optimism that we will come up with an international agreement. And we can start to see the impact of this around the world now. You know, on February 10th, the world's largest solar photovoltaic farm opened in California, in Riverside County, just east of Los Angeles. It will produce about 600 megawatts of electricity when the sun is shining. It occupies a little over 14 square kilometers of desert land. 
which is about one third the footprint of the Site C dam. It will produce about half the power of the Site C dam when the sun is shining. But what's really interesting about this new solar farm is that they are going to sell the electricity from that farm, it's a private sector developer, to Pacific Gas and Electric for seven cents a kilowatt hour. That's cheap. That's cheap. And they're going to make money doing that. So why aren't we promoting this kind of installation internationally in sunny parts of the world? We can start to make the same arguments for wind power. British Columbia has probably 9 billion watts worth of accessible wind power, relatively easily accessible wind power. The price keeps falling. The opportunities are there to do things differently and to do them better with significant environmental benefit. Now, I don't want to overstay my welcome here, so I will close with just a simple question. And I, and I don't want to put Minister Polak on the spot at all, but I would invite her to speculate as to where she thinks Canada might go with respect to a national carbon tax or carbon pricing system following on from BC's immensely important leadership on this file. Do you think that we have the prospect within the next year or two or three of a national pricing scheme that will help us to control carbon emissions? Thank you. Gee, thanks for such an easy question, Tom. <laughs> uh, so the short answer is if you're asking about it in a couple of years, I would say no. Uh, I do think that eventually countries like Canada uh, will move closer and closer toward uh, a national version of carbon pricing. And, and the simple reason for it is this. Um, if you want to continue to have economic growth and at the same time reduce your emissions, a price on carbon works a lot better than regulations. Regulations are more costly for industry, regulations are more difficult to interpret and control, and regulations end up complicating matters and creating uncertainty in a business environment. One of the reasons that industries enjoy uh, a carbon price, uh, I'm, well, I should maybe put a caveat on that, I'm sure they'd rather pay nothing, um, but as opposed to regulations, one of the reasons that they prefer it is because of the certainty that a carbon price provides. They can look at their bottom line and they can factor in a price on carbon, $30 a ton in British Columbia, uh, and then they've, it's very simple and uh, they know exactly what their obligations are. They also know uh, that if they want to save money on the carbon tax, uh, there's a way to do that and that's invest in innovation. Uh, that'll drive down their emissions. So they get a, they get a double benefit uh, when they do that. In terms of Canada though, um, <clears throat> to, be, to be fair to the federal government, uh, it's not as though there's unanimity amongst the provinces in terms of which way they would like to go. We've seen different provinces make different choices. And then if you think of the territories, for example, I was uh, recently in Ottawa uh, for a meeting of ministers who have responsibility for these areas and uh, talking to uh, the minister from Nunavut. Well, if you start talking about a carbon tax that's structured the same way British Columbia's is in Nunavut, I don't know if at this point in time it would necessarily achieve the kinds of things it has. So time will tell. I think we will eventually get there, but I don't think it's going to be in a couple of years. Um, I'll just invite if either the mayor or the, your excellency would wish to make any comment or question at this point. Or, or, good. <laughs> I mean, happy to. I'd, I. Um, I mean, I think it's it's regrettable that the car carbon tax was frozen. I think that was there was great leadership to get it up to 30 bucks a ton, and that's and it's shown to have had no impact. Probably had positive impact on our economy uh, at the, to this date. But there's clearly, I mean, to make a, a direct example, an increase in the carbon tax regionally could be paying for our transit right now, uh, and that's not on the table. That was an option. So it's, I mean, I think it's, we'd all like to see ongoing leadership. I think it's, um, it's great when it happens. Uh, and it, I know it's a challenge when other jurisdictions are dragging. Uh, but when we, we have seen positive results, I think it's, um, it's important to keep making progress. Uh, and there, uh, there are certainly uh, 
strategies to deploy those dollars in ways that will uh, will benefit the economy and will reduce our, our carbon impacts. And I don't, you know, you hear some compelling uh, words in Ontario and Quebec on this, but other provinces not so much. I'd say uh, beyond that, the, the, the subsidies to fossil fuels have to end. They absolutely have to end. All national governments, provincial governments, it's, that's, now that's a, just a simple straight up uh, step that needs to be taken. When we know we have to eliminate them over time, uh, actually investing money in uh, accelerating the exploitation of fossil fuel resources is, it makes absolutely no sense. It's indefensible. So that's one where take those dollars and put them into renewable energy. Uh, it seems like an obvious step uh, to many of us, but uh, has yet to be taken by, by countries like ours. I'll go to the audience, and uh, this is always the moment the moderator fears that nobody's going to put their hand up. Uh, if this was the United Nations, what you would do is you take this and you put it like that. But unfortunately, only the four or five of us have uh, um, uh, name tags. So please raise your hand in the air so I can see you. I know I've got a couple of colleagues to spot, and I see a colleague of mine uh, down on the left. Paul, please. Uh, Paul Meyer from the Center of Dialogue and the SFU School for International Studies. Uh, I mean, the acronym COP, of course, is uh, the Conference of Parties, and that means states parties uh, to the Framework Convention. And uh, given that uh, sovereign states uh, approach uh, the commitments in different ways, um, and we've seen more forthcoming uh, countries, and we've seen um, the countries that have been very uh, dragging their feet in terms of their contribution to the goals and commitments that have uh, they've been party to as part of the uh, process of uh, under the UN Framework uh, Convention. And my uh, question to uh, Ambassador Chapuy, but also welcome uh, thoughts from any of the other panelists, is what can be done to uh, encourage, induce uh, sovereign states to be more forthcoming uh, in their contributions, both uh, financially and in specifying their ambitions of their emission reductions uh, as we move uh, up towards uh, the Paris conference in December. Uh, professor, thank you for that question. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, an important one on the road to Paris. What are we doing as the presidency? Uh, we are calling on every government, including the Canadian federal government to um, tell us when the national intended national contribution for Paris will be published and uh, to tell us beforehand, if possible, uh, within the framework of the democratic process uh, of each government, uh, to tell us what level of ambition uh, they, 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 they want to express in that contribution, and if they expect after Paris to heighten or not that level of ambition. As you know, very few contribu uh, national contributions have been published up to now. Uh, Europe, the European Union has published its contribution two weeks ago. We are presenting it uh, right now to different governments. We are also financing, helping to finance the national contributions of the countries who do not have a methodology, who do not have the means to do it by themselves, especially smaller states, islands, weak uh, countries. Um, and uh, I guess that your question is, 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 is also uh, about Canada, what France is doing with the Canadian federal government. Uh, for the last uh, six weeks, I've met uh, with the different parties concerned. Uh, I've seen uh, the Ministry of Environment. I'm going to every province. Uh, I, I'm trying to gather information on the Quebec summit that will take place on 14th of April, where the prime ministers and ministers of environment of the 10 provinces and three territories have been invited by Philippe Couillard to, to, to express that level of ambition we hope uh, that Canada will, will express in Paris. Um, I will meet uh, with the Federal Minister of Environment, 
Misa Goglak uh, in a few days, uh, be, um, in April. Um, and um, we uh, have said that uh, we hope the federal government will publish its contribution before the G7, uh, which will take place in Germany the 6th and 7th of June, so that Canada's voice could play a role globally uh, on the road to Paris, and that we hope, we expect, and we hope that this role will be an ambitious one. Of course, we do understand that provinces do not share the same ambitions. We do understand, but it's true in the US, it's true in Brazil, it's true in China, it's true in India. It's not a Canadian uh, uh, issue, huh, per se. We understand that uh, uh, there is a wait and see attitude uh, uh, to, to see the short list of big emitters publishing the contribution, but China is going to. The US has announced uh, a few days ago the, the main parameters of its national contribution. So we are in a position that we never had before. Never had before on climate change negotiations to see countries voluntarily saying to the world what they want to do. And then everybody, the citizens of the world, will decide if that level of ambition is sufficient or not, creating the optimism wave that will, I hope, be a tsunami for all negotiating parties for to achieve in Paris the agreement you expect. I'll go to our next uh, intervener, this gentleman here. And uh, if I could, just two methodology. One, uh, do press your button. I think most people see that, but it's easy to forget. I include myself in that so that the microphones work. And also, I invite you to say your name and any institutional affiliation that you wish to present or not. Please. My name is Douglas Gook. I'm uh, one of the directors of the BC Environmental Network. Um, when the people lead, the leaders uh, have to follow. Um, I was very honored uh, pre-Rio uh, to participate in a major gathering of people's organizations that the Francois Mitterrand government sponsored in your wonderful republic. Um, uh, and I think it contributed immensely to what came out of Rio, which you know was a really a major benchmark for many, many of these issues that we continue to talk about. Um, I'm really interested in um, mechanisms uh, and opportunities uh, combined with COP21 uh, for people's organizations and the kind of uh, um, uh, momentum that I saw at, at that point, at pre-real, uh, to, uh, to be encouraged. I'm just wondering uh, uh, where do you think the role of uh, people's organizations and citizens' organizations uh, have in this? Well, thank you for your comment. Uh, there are many initiatives taking place. Um, they are uh, this meeting, supported by the Embassy of France and the Consulate General of France in Vancouver, uh, is part of these initiatives to gather civil society, as we call it, uh, to, 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 to mobilize. Uh, in Paris, it's, uh, on the road to Paris, there will be many pr uh, conferences, fora, that uh, NGOs are organizing in France and across the world. Please join them. You know, the hashtag COP21 will lead you to many websites and, and, and announcement of gatherings. And in Paris, during the conference, in the village of alternatives, we expect a very open participation and mobilization of, of civil society actors. Uh, we will not have a traditional diplomatic negotiation behind closed doors. Well, there's the UN mechanism that needs to take place. But we hope that 
being a world issue, climate change, uh, the climate change fight should uh, hear what everybody has to say. Uh, it is important that in Paris, the, we, we all go out of Paris with the same feeling that you had going out of Rio. A new page, a new, a new step will have been uh, taken. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, my name is Fergal Duff from the International Society of Doctors for the Environment. Um, well, I'm a frequent visitor here to Vancouver, and of course I'm very impressed by what has been done um, at, the, at the city level here. It's, it's uh, extremely impressive, and just on a few points that have been raised in terms of carbon tax, I think that um, one of the things that may get people on board on the carbon tax, apart from all the benefits that Mayor Gregor Robertson has mentioned, uh, would be to, uh, if the populations in each of these states were aware of the fines that they could be facing if they don't meet their 2020 targets, uh, I think this is one thing uh, that uh, I know in my country, Ireland, um, we will not meet our 2020 targets and the fines are enormous. And But the local populations aren't aware of this. and. The point is, who is going to pay the fine? Is it going to be the taxpayer or the polluter? Um, you know, the, the, the principle of polluter pays doesn't come into this, and, and uh, it should really be emphasized. Um, that's, that's one point, if I, if I may. The other point is, I think there's, of course, I think in this audience where you're probably preaching to the converted, um, well, I think one way of maybe getting our message across is linking the impacts of climate change to human health, which hasn't been done enough. Um, and also applying more of the ecosystem approach. The other difficulty, I, just on the ambassador's um, excellent presentation, why wait till 2020 for this $100 uh, billion? Because scientists are already saying we may have already surpassed the two degree target. And as you know, the agreement will not come into effect. If, even if you get a, a robust agreement in Paris, it doesn't come into effect in 2020, in other words, implementation of that. And are we sure that that's not too late? I mean, this is something I think um, society at all levels should be pushing for earlier action. 2020 may actually be too late. Would you maybe like to comment on some of those, those points, and then I'll ask the ambassador maybe to speak. If, sure, I'll, I'll if comment on the carbon tax piece. Um, you know, one of the challenges, of course, is when you begin down that path, and uh, ours was raised to uh, $30 a ton, uh, there's been a freeze in place that will expire in 2018. We're now turning our mind to uh, what that looks like post-2018. Uh, but one of the things I was given as a mandate by our Premier was uh, to use this time as Minister of Environment to be out there actively engaging with other jurisdictions uh, to try and generate that price on carbon. And I'm happy to say we've, we've been seeing uh, examples of jurisdictions taking that up. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, Boston, uh, is they are about to announce um, or have announced their carbon pricing model. Uh, Washington and Oregon are working to adopt uh, a pricing model. We've talked about Quebec and Ontario. Uh, that is important because um, you get to a certain price point, and some of the research out of Massachusetts says it's at about $30 a ton. Um, you get to a certain price point, and if other jurisdictions around you in terms of your uh, competitive environment are not adopting a price, then it can become a drag on the economy. But we've seen that it can be done. We've done it here, and uh, I think if you want to talk about how do you, how do you have people uh, grab hold of those ideas and understanding that it means something to them, I think you're right about the human health aspect. But I also think um, we have to talk to people in, uh, in everyday language, and it may be different in different places. To talk about climate change is a very different thing in downtown Vancouver uh, than it is in downtown Kitimat, uh, or if you go to Caslo, uh, or if you go to Likely. Um, these smaller towns, resource-dependent towns, um, when you start talking about global warming or climate change, uh, they think you're asking them to join a new religion. 
Um, if you instead start talking about what it really means, right, which is we want to have a world with clean air, clean water, uh, with abundant uh, uh, natural resources um, for all of us around to enjoy, uh, people understand that language, they understand conservation, um, but I think very often um, we do end up in kind of an echo chamber. We don't talk about people's everyday lives. Pine beetle is a great example. Uh, when you go to the interior of BC, there are communities that, you know, years ago, if you started to talk about a carbon price or climate change, well, they'd shake their head at you and, and you know, think you must be from uh, down on the lower mainland. Nowadays, because they've seen the direct impact of the pine beetle, and of course, for, for those who may not know, I mean, the reason we have pine beetle is because it just doesn't get cold enough in the winters in BC uh, in the interior to freeze them out. It used to, it doesn't anymore. Um, those people understand that. So I think we have to find ways to talk about people's everyday lives and the potential impact um, that a uh, even a two degree rise in, in uh, global temperatures could have. Is, is Paris going to be ambitious enough? Is it too late? Well, in France, we always say it's never too late. <laughs> is it too much? Is it not enough? We're going to hear these questions on the road to Paris. For some, it will be too much. For others, it will be not enough. OK. What we want to achieve is an agreement. An agreement is the fruit of compromise. As long as we have, we get a new international legally binding regime on 1st of January 2016, and because it will have some, in some countries to be, to be ratified by parliaments, in some countries, it will be an executive order. For instance, we have this discussion with uh, many countries, including the US. Remember that Kyoto was not ratified by the US Congress. So we need to find ways with the US administration to not to repeat that accident on the road of climate change negotiations. So let's be ambitious, but ambitious enough to reach the international agreement we need. And once we have an international agreement, it's like when you enter a, a wedding, marriage, then you have discipline. Then you, you, you are wary of the reaction of your partner. And because you are married, you are wedded, then you need to prove every year to your companion that you love him or her, and then you bring new ambitions to your marriage. That's what we expect. So what is not enough today might be sufficient tomorrow. But yes, I agree. The 2 person target is very ambitious. It might be too late. But if collectively we enter into a relationship of binding agreements, then we have a chance. If we don't do it, then there is no chance at all. And, so, and then we will have a collective failure. That's unacceptable. Uh, the gentleman at the back of the room. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Stefan Hoch from the University of Freiburg in Germany, as well as Perspectives Climate Change, a climate policy uh, research and consulting organization. Um, I work a lot with governments in Europe and in Africa and other regions on international climate policy, and I very often point to uh, the climate policy in BC as a lighthouse example and as a role model, um, because really it is, it uh, has been, um, yeah, a very significant and impressive achievement. But I do have to admit also that I have some open questions or even concerns about how this is going forward. Because even in the official communication to the UN that the federal government has submitted in December, we can see a very significant increase in greenhouse gas emissions in this province. And that is primarily because of the development of the unconventional gas sector, in particular LNG. So my 
very simple questions here. Um, is there, to the minister, is there a 2030 target for greenhouse gas emission reductions in BC? We know there are legislative targets for 2020 and 2050, but at least my knowledge so far, there is not a target for 2030, which is, of course, the timeline that you know countries globally work towards in formulating their INDCs, their nationally determined contributions. And I'm encouraged by your remark and how you explained how you're working with the federal government and helping them to formulate an ambitious contribution. So I'm wondering, you know, what the BC part of that puzzle is. So what is the 2030 target for BC? And if it doesn't exist yet, when will it be uh, formulated? And um, related to that, uh, you know, I've already hinted at that, but I want to make it even more clear. I mean, there's a potential conflict between the legislated climate targets and the development of the unconventional gas activities in this province. And how does the government intend to reconcile these two conflicting developments? Thank you. Thank you. So, um, you have started us now on the path to Paris because one of the things that I'm charged with doing is taking a look at what is the next step. I mean, 28 or 28, 2008 uh, was our original climate action plan. It was aggressive. Uh, it set ambitious goals, and uh, we were working very hard. And as a result, and not just government, I mean, overall, uh, cities, towns, individuals, we managed to achieve our 2012 interim target. Uh, that was a huge success, especially at a time when our economy was growing. But here's what's important to remember about that. When we set those targets in 2008, everybody said we couldn't meet them and grow the economy. They all said that. You cannot keep up the pace or expand the pace of resource <coughs> development and still meet those targets. Um, we are now faced with a similar challenge with the development of liquefied natural gas. No question. Um, it would be very easy simply not to develop it and therefore not have that challenge. Um, however, <laughs> however, then one has to answer the question, what do you do for a country like Chile? Chile now generates 100% of their electricity, their power, using coal and diesel. The transition fuel, one of them, that they're looking at is liquefied natural gas. Why? Because the path for them to completely using renewables, uh, they, don't, they aren't surrounded with what we're surrounded by. And so you can make a choice. You can let countries that are reliant on uh, much dirtier fossil fuels, um, you can let them languish for another 20 years before the clean energy revolution is viable in their countries, many of them developing nations, or you can recognize that globally, liquefied natural gas, natural gas, is going to serve as a transition fuel for countries like that. Uh, China's a really good example. Um, you take a look at the commitments that China has made, and uh, there, uh, if you take it, the latest Bloomberg report uh, shows China's coal consumption has dropped by 2.9% based on their uh, commitment, and their GHG emissions have fallen by 2%, and they have aggressive targets to continue shutting down coal power. Um, liquefied natural gas will be part of that. Uh, so it's about reaching that global balance. As we look ahead to what the next steps are in climate action, because they have to be there, whether or not we were developing unconventional gas, we would still have to take on additional actions in order to achieve our targets. Um, we now have to lay out that pathway as we move to Paris. Uh, we have our existing 2020 and 2050 targets, um, but we have to outline rolling targets in between so that we know uh, whether or not we're reaching those and whether or not we're on track and where we need to make adjustments. It is going to be a monumental effort, but we've done it before and we believe we can do it again. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I don't want to be rude, but uh, I have asked for the 2030 target. Okay, we should give somebody else a chance to speak. So, the gentleman at the back Hi. of the room. Uh, yeah, James Holfleif, uh researcher in climate change and uh, energy. I want to recognize and I appreciate uh, the Honorable Minister Polak's announcement this week on the clean uh, vehicle. That was a good thing to see. 
But my question is uh, for Ambassador Chapuy, and I'm wondering about what you think of the role of trade measures in the negotiations, such as trade restrictions or tariffs, for those countries that don't, are, don't plan to participate or aren't part of a global agreement. Uh, to my knowledge, there is absolutely no punitive scheme on the road to Paris. Uh, it is a UN uh, conference, and uh, the, the scheme of things is to have all countries on board voluntarily presenting their contribution. That contribution could be disappointing, but they have to state what is their policy uh, on, on the environment and the fight against climate change. But there's, to my knowledge, once again, no sanctions, no punitive action ever planned in that meeting, because if they were, there will be uh, no agreement to, to, conf to convene such a conference. For one. For two, maybe the question, your question arises from the fact that uh, carbon prices could uh, penalize, could impair uh, countries who do rely excessively on fossil fuels. And that's where uh, it is interesting for me to follow the debate uh, that was open just before on carbon tax, national carbon market, or carbon pricing. It's clear that if you look only at Canada, if different provinces or different cities in Canada have different policies on carbon tax, carbon pricing, then you have a situation where some province could, some company in a province should say, I am unfairly treated within the federation. And I guess that's a worry of the federal government, that there should be, at one moment in time, a reflection on that issue. Because as far as I understand, when I talk to companies in Canada, they have anticipated yes. a carbon tax or a carbon market. When I was in Montreal for the Americana Fair uh, two weeks ago, it was very interesting to see how all the actors of the green technologies in Canada and North America have anticipated a unified carbon market. That's very encouraging. So we are not on the road of sanctions for non-cooperative states. We are on the road of pedagogy, inciting and helping the countries who cannot or would not fight against climate change by giving them the possibility to fight. When you do not have weapons, you cannot fight. So let's give them the resources and the technologies so they can be alongside in the column of the international community. Getting close to the end of our time, so what I propose to do is to take questions briefly and just collect them, and then we'll let each of our panelists uh, identify which ones that they can answer. So I'll start with the gentleman with the purple shirt. Uh, hi there, uh, Matt Horn with the Pemmet Institute. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks. Um, this question was originally directed for Minister Polak and Mayor Robertson, but I guess feel free to take it as you wish. Uh, interested in your thoughts on what a national Canadian success looks like in the lead up to Paris, and that would sort of be federally, provincially, local government. And as a second part to that, like what can your what do you th what do you see your jurisdictions doing contributing to that success? The questions as I quickly see them, uh, lady with the green, yes. Uh, here, yeah. My name is Diana Ellis, and I'm the chair of the Suzuki Elder Council. We're a group of elders working with and through the David Suzuki Foundation. And in our work with youth, uh, two things are emerging. This is more a comment. 
Uh, then a question. The first uh, matter that's really emerging for us is the intense energy, concern, and deep creativity of the youth. It's my future, not yours, said a number of them very clearly to us when they were attending our annual retreat last summer. With this, we've also found a, a deep undercurrent of sadness, perhaps even uh, grief held by elders and by youth at what lies ahead. And this gives us all great pause. Uh, we reflect, uh, we hope, we plan, we vision, and we are very impatient, and we will be in Paris. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joseph Pallant with Brinkman Climate. And combining the local and subnational uh, components of today with the global and international is very important, I think, as we in BC look to lead up to Paris and what we should be doing. Um, the Paris Agreement will be denominated in tons of CO2 equivalent. The atmosphere cares about environmental certainty rather than price certainty. And this is why France, the EU, and likely the rest of the countries are likely to implement a cap and trade system rather than a carbon tax, which just provides price certainty. I wanted to ask if any of the speakers have thoughts on moving to a regional and national cap and trade system in our jurisdictions. Thank you. I know a couple of you who have already spoken have indicated that you're interested. I, I invite you to take the opportunity maybe to if any of our guests are willing to stay, to put your questions directly afterwards, because I'm only going to give people one chance. So um, very quickly, this gentleman and you, sir, at the front, and then we'll take one Twitter question, and then we'll turn it to our panel to, to wrap up. So. Uh, my name is Travis, and uh, I work for the Richmond School District. Uh, the U.S. government had recently signed a trade uh, uh, agreement with China on cl uh, climate change. And according to that agreement, uh, China will be allowed to increase carbon emission until the year 2035. So my question is, um, is there any possibility that China will be able to come up with uh, better targets for the Paris Conference in reducing its carbon emission? would be the most effective action for citizens to take in the lead up to COP21. And then lastly, we'll take a question from that's coming on Twitter. So the question from Twitter is from Mary McMillan. Is there a way to tie housing affordability to renewables? And I think that's a great lead in because I plan to actually invite our speakers in reverse order. So maybe starting with the mayor, if you would wish to respond to uh, any of those elements that were raised, and then we'll the minister, and then lastly the ambassador. So. Okay. Well, I'll do my best with uh, with a couple of these. Uh, maybe starting with the national. What does national success look like uh, with the federal government? I mean, obviously, it'd be great to see Canada uh, become a leader on uh, on climate change and and join with uh, the many other nations around the world, uh, making um, meaningful binding commitments to uh, dramatically reduce our emissions and uh, and shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy. I, I think it, it would be great to see that leadership. It doesn't uh, look hopeful, but we have a federal election in the, in the wings, and that may affect Canada's position uh, by the time we get to Paris, but the timelines are, uh, are difficult. Uh, but I, notwithstanding whatever happens in terms of Canada's targets, if uh, the federal government was to commit to funding uh, transit in cities across Canada. Every big city is our top priority that I join with the mayors across this country to call for funding for transit uh, across our country. And uh, we don't have any commitments from the federal government, which is, uh, which is shocking. And <clears throat> we stand apart from all of the uh, nations at, at our level of economic activity right now without any uh, federal transit funding at this point. Uh, and as I said, uh, the opportunity to, to take subsidies that are currently going into fossil fuels and invest them in renewable energy in cities, clean tech solutions in cities, uh, really investing in the innovation economy that, that reduces our impacts. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of money being invested uh, in exploiting fossil fuels that could go into 
the uh, almost 90 percent of Canadians living in cities and, and wanting to see uh, our cities be more energy efficient and, and clean. So those would be national success stories on the ground that could happen uh, irrespective of Paris, but we'd like to obviously both of those things, the walk uh, and the talk happening uh, from our federal government. Uh, I, I won't speak to cap and trade versus, uh, versus carbon tax. I think it's, that's an endless debate at this point. It would be nice to just see it go one way or the other collectively and, and carbon pricing be effective. Um, and in terms of um, China's target, it was an interesting question. I, what, what I hear from uh, Chinese mayors who, uh, who wield a lot more power than uh, Canadian mayors, uh, comparatively, most cities around the world, that's the circumstances, and China is, is no different. There, there is a massive uh, desire to see a, a, a much more aggressive timeline on reducing emissions. Pollution is a, is a, is a public health catastrophe in China right now. Uh, and so the, if, if, whether it's for health purposes primarily, and you see, uh, you see the flight of, of uh, people with capital uh, and talent leaving Chinese cities right now and coming to places like Vancouver because they literally can't breathe and don't want to raise their kids in that, it's having dramatic impacts on China's uh, future. And so from the, from the cities and the, the livability that's, uh, that's going down the drain there, I, I think we may well see much more aggressive targets emerge. Great to see uh, these, these initial ones, but I think, uh, I think as uh, China tends to do, they're, they're setting a bar and they're going to overachieve that, and hopefully uh, the, that will happen much more aggressively in these years to come. I love that question about housing affordability, and uh, I wish I had a good answer for that one. Uh, that's work in progress, but there's no doubt that more efficient, uh, energy efficient buildings uh, are, are more affordable in the long run. Life cycle analysis on green buildings, and that's why we have the greenest building code in North America, because it, it means lower energy costs, more affordability over the life of the building, uh, presuming you have some capital at the front end to, to offset that cost. But it's, there's a win-win there, um, and um, the, there's a bigger question around housing affordability that's the price of the land that we... Uh, that we can only grapple with through more density in cities, which is also more environmentally uh, sustainable as well. So I'll leave it there, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick comment on, on the youth comments. Um, uh, we have to keep hearing those comments. We have to keep remembering uh, that uh, when, you know, we talk about a 2050 target, well, I don't want to reveal my age, but I mean, you know, you could be certain I'm not going to be uh, spending much time thinking about it in the year uh, 2050. Uh, my daughter will, right? My daughter's 27. Uh, she works for the food bank. She is a vegan. She is an animal rights activist. Um, you get the picture. So I hear about this a lot. <laughs> um, but I think it's important that we keep hearing about it. Because those of us in leadership, um, the, uh, the people who are uh, in places of influence and power, uh, they know how to get a hold of us. They talk to us frequently. And the people who don't necessarily uh, get that voice heard often uh, in fora around climate action are the youth. So uh, we have to keep those comments in front of us. Uh, what would success for Canada look like? I think realistically, it would be uh, coming to the table with practical actions. Um, I believe, I'm optimistic that Canada will be part of forming an agreement around legislated targets. Uh, what I'm anxious to see is what are the practical steps that they are going to uh, initiate to achieve those. Um, it's no simple thing. I don't want to underestimate it. Um, but that, to me, would be success coming from Paris, is that an agreement on legislated targets would result in some very tangible uh, policy actions uh, that we would see coming out of that for Canada. Uh, cap and trade or carbon price, uh, you can also have both. Uh, some jurisdictions have chosen to do that. Um, but I do think it's a bit of a uh, uh, time will tell what, uh, what becomes the most adopted. It's a bit like the beta VHS uh, argument. I'm revealing my age again. Um, but it, it really will come down to um, something uh, that the ambassador said that's very important uh, as we have this discussion here. We have a, a well, in this room, we have a very Vancouver, uh, certainly British Columbia kind of perspective. 
Um, when you are in meetings uh, like in Lima or what will happen in Paris, um, you start to realize that there are very many nations who are very concerned about this, want to do something, and they really lack the opportunities that we have um, that are so available to us. And so uh, cap and trade, carbon price, I think a lot of it will depend on how countries develop and what then becomes uh, the most practical solution for them. Most effective action for citizens is make sure that your elected representatives know um, that if it comes, for example, to something like a carbon tax, a carbon price, um, that you'll support that. One of the most effective things that I've been able to share with other elected people in other jurisdictions where they're interested in a carbon tax is that you can actually win elections after you do that. Because their belief is that if you put in place a carbon tax, it is a guarantee that you will lose the next election. Um, that's a very real and tangible thing you can do, is let your elected representatives know that you will support policy actions on the ground um, with your voting. Tying housing affordability to emissions, uh, it is complicated from the standpoint of return on investment for technology, but um, Mayor Robertson uh, talked about land and density. The really simple answer to um, affordability of housing and emissions is size. If you take a look at what the size of the average home for a family of two was back in the 50s, uh, I'll tell you, you would look at that today and no family with two kids uh, would be looking to move into it. They would think it was a tiny little box. But it was okay for us back then. So part of what we have to do is reflect on what our expectations are for our lifestyle as well um, and think about what kind of footprint we're leaving. Uh, so. That's the low-tech solution. We certainly uh, have to see more innovation, and we're seeing a lot of it. Uh, we have to see it become more affordable for people in and of itself. Thank you very much for your time tonight. And finally, Ambassador. Well, no more questions left to me, except uh, I'll take up the one on China, because I've I worked a long time in China. And I remember, it was not so long ago, let's say two or three years, that you would not find any expert in the world that would have predicted the China-US agreement of last November. Once again, people have failed to understand Chinese policies. Because that agreement of November is, of course, a great diplomatic success for both America and China. But more importantly, it is a signal to the world that the next economic superpower is taking its responsibilities and, and showing the world that it has ambitions in fighting climate change. Can it do better? Sure. If we help China to do better, it will do better. Because once again, the majority of emissions in China are the fruit of non-Chinese companies. So if our companies help the Chinese government reach its uh, uh, emissions target, then it can do better by 2035. And last but not least, I want to thank all of you to have come today and thank uh, Mayor Robertson and Minister Polak for uh, uh, this great debate we had today to ensure the success of Paris 2015. Thanks to all. Thanks, everyone. I think <clears throat> we've actually run 10 minutes over time, but I detected no loss in interest and attention given this really rich discussion. Great interventions by our three speakers and by our, our commentator. Thank you so much for attending. And uh, please continue to follow hash COP21. I think detect the ambassador was already doing some tweeting while uh, he was at the desk. And uh, look forward to seeing you at future Carbon Talks. Thank you. Bye-bye.